with a man of God. Yes, it's as I, I consider him the greatest man of God alive. We are grateful he's here with us. We love you, Pastor Benny, and we thank God you came to minister to us. That you could accept our humble invitation and you were willing to come. Thank you so much. So please, everybody, stand up. And I want to welcome Pastor Benny Him on the stage. Jesus be the glory and God's people said amen and Lord we thank you for your mercy we thank you wonderful Lord where would we be without you we don't even want to think about that you are our life and our all and to you precious Jesus precious Jesus be all the glory and the honor and Lord, bless these wonderful people who've come tonight to see you and hear your blessed voice. We give you praise. Bless Bishop Robinson, his wife, the leaders here, the pastors who've come. Let your will be done, Lord. Let your will be done. Blessed be your name, Savior. Lift your hands and thank him for his love, saints. thing in all my life is loving you. I want to love you so much more. Love you so much more. The greatest thing in all our life is to just love you more. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about the, the name of Jesus, saints. So close your eyes and lift your hands and forget everyone else and forget your troubles. Forget the confusion of life. And just let's just see the Lord now. And there is something about your name you're a master savior Jesus like the fragrance after the rain dearest Jesus Jesus Jesus, let all heaven and the earth proclaim and kings and kingdoms they'll all pass away but there's something about Jesus, 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 there is something about your name, Master, Master, Savior. 
like the fragrance after the rain. Here is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and the earth. But there's something about your name. And tonight, all you have to do tonight is one thing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim and then disappear in the light of His glory and grace. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. And where you lead me, I will follow. Lift your hands and tell it. Where you lead me, I will follow. Where you lead me, I will follow. I'll go with you, Lord. I'll go with you. Sing it again, it's a commitment. Where you lead me, I will follow. Where you lead me, I will follow. Lord, where you lead me, I will follow. I'll go. Lord, I pray tonight, establish us in your word. Establish your word in us. Pour within us a fire we've never known, a fire of love. Intensify our love for you. Intensify it so much, Lord, that you'll just burn the world out of us. Burn this world out of us. We don't want it. We just don't want it. We want you, your knowledge, your word, and your fullness. Now, Lord, you know we're not perfect. Only you are. We can't even trust our own hearts. We trust only you. So touch us afresh tonight, Lord. Empower us one more time. Fill us again. In Jesus' name. Fill us one more time. 
lift your hands to heaven for just a moment. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh. your people, Lord, and new and afresh, in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. I'm glad you all are here. And I'm glad to be with my friends, and especially the bishop from Zambia. I knew his uncle, wasn't it? Your uncle, the, the president. Yeah. So it's nice to be with all of you sweet people and thank you for inviting me and I want to say thank you to Linda Vega, dear sweet Linda Vega, because she's the one who actually um, told me about you and then Suzanne, you know, when, when you're married to a girl like Suzanne, <laughs> it's tough to say no. So she kind of came after me, she said, now Benny, you gotta go, okay, but where am I going? And she didn't say a whole lot about that, so I'm here. We've been, we've been married. Thank you, thank you. One time, I love this, one time she was invited to go speak in Boston to about 3,000 women. And she changed her mind about going. And she said, will you take my place? I said, no. They invited you, not me. She said, no, I can't do it. I said, she said, please, you gotta take my place in Boston. I said, look, they invited you. They did not invite me. I said, so you have to keep the commitment. Well, she wasn't feeling well physically, and I said, okay, you know, I'll help all I can. So I show up to Boston, I see these women, 3,000 of them dressed in white. No makeup on their face, buns on their head, and I was in shock. They were called the Lord's, what's, what's it, the Lord's handmaidens. I think, Marie, you were one of them. Why don't you come sit down and behave yourself? So here I am with 3,000 women, very few men, and they were all singing. And uh, they didn't sound that good. <laughs> you know, I've gotten old now, so I lost my filter. <laughs> you know, the older you get, the more you don't care what people think, right? <laughs> so anyway, so they were singing. I'm thinking, oh, dear God, I wish they'd stop singing. <laughs> and then my, my staff said, my staff said, well, how long will you be? I said, this will be the quickest thing, thing you ever saw in your life. <laughs> Instead, I preached the entire book of Acts. Oh. It was three hours. 
And they all said, we thought you said it would be only a very short sermon. I said, well, the Lord took over. Amen. But then, you know, it turned out as such an amazing night with those sweet women. And, uh, but anyway, so that was the last time Suzanne said, you got to go. And now again, this time, <laughs> you got to go. But this is much nicer. <laughs> this easier. When, look, look, when you go to a place with 3,000 women all dressed in white and nobody has makeup, it's scary. <laughs> but tonight, you all look normal. Thank you very much for that. Thank the Lord. Anyways, I just wanted to make you laugh. So um, before, now, by the way, where is the dear man from, uh, what did he say, Mozambique, right? Or Cameroon, Cameroon. Oh, you're from Mozambique? Oh, oh you're from... Cameroon, Cameroon. God bless you, sir. We'll talk afterwards. I went to Nigeria. Thank you. How many, by the way, how many? Please, please. How many here from Nigeria? Wow. How about, how about, how about Cameroon? Wow. Now, you know, I've never been, I, I don't think I've been to Cameroon, right? Okay. So I've been to Zimbabwe, I've been to Zambia, I've been to Ghana and Uganda. And, but I haven't been to some of those countries. Well, I would love to come to Cameroon. In the Lord's... Thank you, sir. In the Lord's good moment, good time, right? Okay, that's great. Listen, um, just something real quick. I would love tonight to um, Bishop, what is it? There you go. Bishop Robinson had asked if I take the offering. I said, of course, with, 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 with pleasure. So I would like to kind of just spend a few moments with you just to kind of lift your faith. And then I'm going to minister the word. I'd like to minister tonight on a very important subject, mortifying the deeds of the body. Amen. Say amen. amen. We need to know how. Because we live in a world today that's becoming more dangerous. But first, though, can we close those doors so we don't hear those kids screaming. Okay. Please, thank you. I know you're probably warmer than you want to be, but uh, is, it, is it okay? Okay, you're not too, too warm, I hope, right? All right. Great. Um, Lord, I thank you. Just lift your hands with me. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for your promises. You are God Almighty, able to do way more than we can believe for. And to you be all the praise and God's people said amen. amen. When it comes to the subject of finances, people get very uh, nervous sometimes, but there's no need to get nervous because it's really a very exciting uh, word. It's, it's a very exciting thing. You look at the promises of God when it comes to finances are quite powerful, to be honest with you. Yeah. And please help me with those children that are not so comfortable. So if they start crying, just for all of us and for our sake, and those sitting next to you, just take, you know, take your, your uh, little baby outside till they get all calm and so forth. Because we really have come to hear the word of God. Amen. Not babies. God's people said. I'm not, I'm not mean. I'm just me. I demand reverence for the scriptures and the presence of God. And the people said another? Amen. Good. Okay. So, when I was young, when I was young, I, of course, grew up in Israel. I was taught by Catholic sisters, Franciscan sisters. No, no, don't turn the lights down. I want to see the people. Good. They're very good-looking people. Please. <laughs> So I was taught that poverty is God's will. Now think about, from the time I was in preschool, because I, I actually went to preschool in Jaffa, I was three years old when I went to preschool. 
Why? I have no idea. And, and you hear all the time, and, and you're, you're being brought up by these Franciscan monks who looked very poor. They wore a brown robe and sandals. That's it. Anybody here grew up Catholic? Okay, a lot of you. So me too, okay? Even though our parents were not Catholic, I went to Catholic school, and my mentality was Catholic. So they said that only poor people will make heaven. And they, and they would use the scripture continually, how the gospel is preached to the poor. The gospel is preached to the poor. And then they would literally tell you clearly that, that rich people go to hell and poor people go to heaven. Well, for goodness sake, nobody wanted to go to hell. So nobody wanted money. Because we thought, if you get money, you're going to hell. Now that's 15 years of it. For 15 years, that's all I heard, and that's all I believed. Now we, we immigrate to Canada, and I went to another school in Canada, not Catholic, but very influenced by the Catholic world in, in, in Canada. French-Canadian school. And the French-Canadians, a lot of them are Catholic. So anyways, same mentality, you know, poor people go to heaven and rich people go to hell. Well, then I got saved, thank God. And I'm reading the Bible. And I read where Abraham was rich. I was shocked. <laughs> because in the school in Israel, they never really taught the Old Testament. It's a Catholic school. And all they talked about is Jesus the apostles, Mary, and so forth, and nobody mentioned the word, the word Israel in school. Even though I lived in Israel, I never was told, never was told, Jesus was Jewish. Yeah, that's right, lady. She said, oh my God. I got into a fight with a kid in class who said to me that Jesus was a Jew. I said, no, he's not a Jew. And we got into an argument in class in Israel. So I went home, I said to my father, I said, is Jesus really Jewish? And he, and he said, yes. But the biggest shock of my life was when he said that Mary was Jewish. I, I, I was f so convinced Mary was Catholic. <laughs> I never thought that Mary was a Jew. And when my father told me that Mary and Jesus were Jewish, I was shocked. Bishop, is that you? Bishop Don, I did not know you're here. I saw somebody sitting there, but I did not know it was you. Can, can I give you a hug? This is Bishop Don Mears. Oh, it's so nice to be with you. I knew his father. I used to go preach for your daddy way back then. You look fabulous. Look at you. You look marvelous. I love it. And this is your wife? Hi, darling. Uh, well, no, God bless you, too. I'm glad I'm going to be with you Sunday. Good. Maybe you can, you can announce it. Tell them where, where the place is in just a little bit. Okay. Anyway, so let me go back. I'm so glad to see you. My goodness, you, made me, I'm, you, you kind of made my evening. Thank you. It's a wonderful friend. Yes, give him a big God bless you and his wife, please. Bishop Don Mears. Yeah. So anyways, so, so now I'm finding out Jesus was Jewish, Mary was Jewish, the apostles were Jewish. But then, of course, later we immigrated to Canada. I'm reading my Bible, and I'm now I'm, I'm kind of making a new discovery that Abraham was rich. That was a new one. And Isaac was rich, and Jacob was rich. What really got me is that Solomon was so rich, it, was, it blew my mind how rich that, that man was. And I'm thinking, those sisters never read the Old Testament. <laughs> they never knew what it says about Abraham. All they thought about was Jesus. Well, we went to the same school, Rose and I, because she was in the girls' section. That's my sister, Rose. She was in the girls' section. I was in the boys' section because they did not mix us, you know, mix us up back then. Anyway, so, 
Now, I get the shock of my life again, not only from the Bible, and now I begin to see that the Bible doesn't teach that poverty is God's will. I'm discovering over and over that God blessed his people with financial wealth, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, King David, Solomon, and so forth, and that God's word really promises prosperity. It's there in the Bible. You can't erase it. Well, here's another shock. The Pope, Pope John Paul, remember him? Yes. Wanted to meet me. That was a real shock. A man named Peter Bahu, who went to school with me and was neighbors with us, became and still is a very high official in the Vatican to this day. So when we immigrated, he went to New York, and we went to Toronto. He began working for the Vatican, and I, of course, went to school in Canada. So one day I get a call from him. He said, listen, the Pope wants to meet you. I said, come on, don't joke. He said, he said I'm serious. He said, he's, and, and because of Peter's, of his position, he's in charge to this day of all the art and the music in the Vatican is, is controlled by a man I've, we grew up together when we were kids in, in, the, in the Holy Land. So he said, I'm going to take you in and introduce you to the Pope privately in his chapel. I said, Peter, please you know, stop joking. He said, I'm not joking. It's real. I said, OK, let's go. So I go to the Vatican, and he said, Meet me on the right side of the basilica, right there in the square, and I'll take you there. So now I come up, and he met me at these, this area where you go up the stairs, a lot of stairs to, to climb. If you're looking at St. Peter's Basilica, on the, on the side there's a little way where you actually get up. You have to go through the security entrance, all that. And so we climb up, and suddenly I'm inside the Vatican, and I, we turn right. If you ever look at the picture of the, of the big basilica, it's quite long. So you have the balcony where the Pope stands, and then right behind this is this massive, massive building. Well, imagine that right behind there is one painting of Michelangelo that goes all the way down that hall. I'm not kidding if I tell you it is higher than this wall, maybe twice, and it's longer than this building by probably, oh dear Lord, a, a lot. And all the way down, I'm looking at one painting of this amazing work of Michelangelo. I said, Peter, because we grew up in the same class, I said, those nuns ought to see this. <laughs> I said, they told us that only the, the poor man only the poor make heaven. I said, this Pope doesn't believe what they taught us. <laughs> he said, you're right. I said, this painting, I said, that would finance my ministry throughout the millennium. <laughs> I said, if, if, if I could sell this one painting, it would, it would supply the ministry I'm in for a thousand years. I said, the Pope does not believe in poverty. I said, we believe those nuns and monks all are growing up years in the, in the Catholic school, but the Pope doesn't believe what they say. They ought to come here and see this. He said, you're right. So it's sad. You know, you, gr you grow up believing things that are not true. Even the Pope doesn't believe that the poor, only the poor go to heaven. He's a, he, one of the richest men I think I've ever met in my life. So much so, so much so, I met him actually twice. In New York, when he came to New York years, years ago to the, uh, to the city, and he was in Madison Square and all this, they invited me to come and, and actually see him. And, the, and the, cardinal, the cardinal at that time of New York invited me to come and see him. And I went to see him, and he and I became friends. And I, at one time he said, because uh, I used to wear ties back then, you know, so he said, I like your tie, Benny. I said, your eminence, you, don't, you, 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 you do not wear one. He said, I want your tie. I said, why? You don't wear a tie. He said, how do you know? 
So I gave him my tie, and he was very grateful. And then he said, I want to introduce you to the Pope. I said, well, I, I already met him. He said, no, this will be different. He said, I will introduce you this time. I said, wow, now this is the, the, the cardinal of New York City, you know. So I, I come, and they invited me to go to the seminary uh, in New York. I was one of, I was the only Pentecostal with 2,000 priests <laughs> where the, the, these were brand new priests that were graduating, and the Pope went there to you know, preach. I was amazed. I got to tell you something. He spoke on the Holy Spirit. I was crying sitting to him, uh, just, just hearing him. I could not believe what I was hearing. That man knew God. I don't care what anybody says. That Pope knew the Lord because he really taught on the Holy Spirit, no different than I would teach on the Holy Spirit. He told the priest, he said, without the Holy Spirit, you will fail. And I was like stunned. I thought, wow, thank God somebody's telling them that. So at the end, he comes to an area, and I'm there with about like maybe five or six people. And uh, as he comes, uh, uh, the colonel named O'Connor, I mean, you may remember the name, he says, this has been him, our friend. And he almost gave me a big hug, and it was quite a beautiful moment for me. But anyways, I helped them to fix the organ so he can have the service. Their organ was broken at the seminary. And I gave the Catholic Church $100,000 to fix that, that organ, and uh, you know, they, to bless those priests. Sometimes you have to sow seed like that, you know what I mean? You can't believe what, what happened after that, but I'll tell you in just a second about that. But anyways, I'm here to tell you that sometimes we hear things like I did for all those years that are not biblical and we believe them, such as that poverty is the way to heaven. Not in the Bible. So God Almighty has given us some amazing promises. Then later, <clears throat> as, as I got to understand the word and the scriptures and ministry a little more. <laughs> Just before I married Suzanne, her father sat me down. I probably told the story. Maybe you heard it. If not, you'll love hearing it again. And I'm sitting on the floor with him. And he began asking me questions. This is we, 1979 we got married. And it was, the, it was the summer of 79. He sits me on the floor. And he's, you know, we're talking back and forth about family, da 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 and then he says, I want to know, are you a giver? I said, this is between God and I. <laughs> he said, you're about to be my son-in-law. It will be between God, you, and I. <laughs> and he became very specific, you know, like, how much do you give? And I got really uncomfortable with his questions. I had just signed a contract in Canada to go on TV in 78 on a station called City TV. I was in the ministry only a few years. We had 3,000 people on Monday nights. And a preacher gave me some wrong advice to go on TV. That, that was before TBN, before Christian television. So now I am on TV in Canada, prime time, Sunday night, all over Toronto. And wham, I'm in debt. You can get in debt real quickly going on TV, secular, prime time, wow. Sunday nights at 9 p.m. So now I'm in debt because I'm on TV and it was not God's time for me to be on TV. So I was under a lot of pressure. I had to take two offerings every service. You know what that does to the crowd. First <laughs> offering, they get very uncomfortable. Second, you know, second offering, they become really hostile. And uh, anyways, <laughs> they, they want to knock you out for the second offering. And this was the early days of the charismatic movement. And those Canadians, they were, sorry to tell you, they were the you know, frozen chosen. They, they, they didn't want to give nothing. <laughs> my, my early crowd was Romanians, Hungarians, people from, from you know, Eastern Europe. Yeah. They're not exactly very, uh, what's the word? Uh, they're very conservative, you know. So Roy had heard about that. So now he's asking questions about my giving to the Lord. And finally said, how much? 
And then I really got, oh, you know, do I tell them how much? I said, well, you know, one Sunday I give 20, next Sunday I give 30, and next Sunday I give 5, and next Sunday I give 10. And then he just, he came alive on the floor. He said, I've been sitting here, word for word, he said, I've been sitting here wrecking my brain, wondering why a, a successful evangelist is in debt. Now I know why. I said, well, please tell me why. He said, you are an emotional giver. Woo, brother. I'm from, I'm from Israel. You tell me I'm an emotional giver. <laughs> We're very wild. That's the wild, wild east, you know, over there. And I got really upset with him. And I said, why do you say that? He said, because you just gave me the reason why you're in debt. I said, well, please tell me. He said, well, you just told me that one Sunday you give this and then up, down, up, down, up, down. He said, how would you like for God to give you the way you've been giving him? I said, he does. Sometimes the offerings are good and sometimes they're bad. <laughs> And then he gave me a line I'll never forget. He said, Benny, the law of giving is a fixed law. You cannot change it. And then he gave me another headline. He said, emotional giving is cursed by God. And then he went on to ask me a question that I had no clue why he would ask it. So he said, how long have you been saved? I'm thinking, what has this got to do with this? I said, well, this is 78, so I got saved in 72. So he went 73, 74, 5, 6, 7, 8. He says, for, for six years, you've, you have given God nothing. I said, what? He said, you gave him zero for six years. I said, no, no, I gave. He said, no, emotional giving is dismissed. I said, are you telling me that everything I gave to God for six years doesn't count? And then he gave me a scripture that scared the lights out of me. Because he said, it's the law of God. It's a fixed law. You cannot change it. He said, you never gave God 10%. You didn't do what the Bible says. He said, that's why you're in trouble. And then I'm thinking, okay, what do I do now? Half of me says he's right. Half of me says maybe he's wrong. But I'm, I'm thinking, well, this is... One of the greatest Bible teachers in America, he had the largest church, you know, Lander called Calvary Assembly at one time, and he was a man of God who really knew the Bible better than anyone I'd ever heard preach and teach. 10,000 people in his church, and I'm thinking, he should know what he's talking about, and then he gives me a scripture from Leviticus, where if I'm not giving properly, God would penalize me 20%. It's in the Bible. I said, show me that again. And he, he read it for me. He said, here it says, if you don't give God the tithe, he'll penalize you 20%. He said, you will lose through not giving. I said, oh, dear God, maybe this is what's happened to me. He said, now you need to go back home to Canada and pay God everything you owe him. I said, listen, uh, Roy, uh, I am in debt already to the TV network, and they're going to sue me if I don't pay. And then he said another line I'll never, I'll never forget. He said, if you will pay God's bills, he'll pay yours. He said, Benny, if you'll pay God's bills, he'll pay yours. And I thought, oh, dear God, do I even listen to this? I'm under pressure from the network and I, I was under pressure from just finances i was in debt to listen to this two hundred thousand dollars young evangelists we just started in ministry and here i am two hundred thousand in debt in those days and then he said you start giving god what you owe him and go back in time and pay all that you have owed for six years i thought this is crazy but I could not deny that the Bible says it in Leviticus and other portions. To honor the Lord with your substance, it says. On the way back, I'm flying home on Eastern Airlines. Remember the old Eastern Airlines that doesn't exist anymore. A battle in my soul. Is Roy right? Is he wrong? I thought, you know what? I have nothing to lose. I get to the office. 
I had a secretary in those days, an old lady called Marion Robinson. I hired her because I was a young evangelist and did not want a young secretary. So I hired the oldest woman I can find. <laughs> she could not even type that woman. She would type with, with one finger. But she was faithful to God and that's all that mattered. So anyways, I went and I said, listen, Marianne, get the checkbook out. She wondered why. And I said, I want you to send 10,000. We had 20,000 in the account. That's it. 20,000 in the account of the ministry in Canada. In that, 200,000. So we've got to start somewhere. I said, I want to send $1,000 to 20 ministries in Canada. She thought I lost my mind. She said, Benny, I wasn't pastor then. She said, Benny, you can't do this. She called the board. The whole board showed up. The whole, seven of them all showed up. Nine, oh, forgive me what am I saying? Nine board members I had back then, they all showed up. Seven of them resigned. Said, we don't want to be a part of a ministry of a man who's lost his mind. And they walked out. And I looked at the two that stayed, Fred Brown and Fred Spring, the two Freds. Old men from, from wonderful people from Canada. Now, Fred Brown was a wonderful businessman, and he used to go hunting every November for moose up in Canada. And when he'd get nervous, his lower lip would tremble real bad. So now his lip began trembling, and he said, are you sure God talked to you? I'll never, I can see his face right now with that lower lip shaking. He said, are you sure God talked to you? I said, yes. Through Roy, he talked to me. And I began sending $1,000 checks to 20 preachers, most of whom hated me. They didn't like me. One of them named Bill Pranker. He and I today are wonderful friends. Bill Pranker looked at me in the, in the face one day and said, I, I'm praying you'll fall because you're my competition. When we were young, it's okay, it's okay. When we were young, you know, young preachers, it doesn't matter. You and I are friends today and very close friends. The Lord said, send $1,000 to Bill Pranker. I said, no, no, please, Lord. I mean, not him. <laughs> I mean, this guy really doesn't like me. The Lord said, send him $1,000. So I... I sent a thousand to twenty ministries. The majority of them didn't even like me in those days. That was on a Wednesday. On a Wednesday. I go home. Bank is empty, Bishop. Zero money in the bank. Thursday, Friday, I'm home. I'm scared to go to the office. Saturday home. Sunday I go to church. Ten cents in my pocket. Before God Almighty. I had ten cents in my pocket. Offering time comes, and the convicting part of God was so strong, he said, give the 10 cents. I said, Lord, you got to be kidding. I just gave you $20,000 on Wednesday. You want my 10 cents. The conviction was so strong, I, I, was, I, was, I was actually shaking. I put my hand in my pocket, got the 10 cents. That's all I had for my name. That's the scariest thing to do in life. No money in the bank, no money in your pocket, no money nowhere. This is the last 10 cents, the last 10 cents for your name. And they had those brass round things they used to pass back then. And when the 10 cents went in that thing, my life went with it. I said, this is it, I'm dead. No, there, there's no future. It's over. I, my last 10 cents are gone. In those days, I wasn't married yet. I was very handsome. <laughs> and the girls were after me, especially one of them in, in, in church. She was a blonde, but I did not like her. So every Sunday after church, the whole church would go to a place called Swiss Chalet. Swiss Chalet is the best chicken in Canada. And so we all would go to Swiss Chalet to eat after church. And generous Benny always paid the bill. So they'd come 15, 20 people, 
to have lunch, and I always wanted to bless them all and pay for the chicken. So that Sunday, they all came and said, let's go to lunch. I said, I don't feel that good. <laughs> word for word. I said, no, I don't feel good. I'm going to go home. They began forcing me. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, I have no money. I'm, they're going to give me the bill like they do every Sunday. What, what an embarrassing thing's going to be. So I'm sitting eating that, that, that chicken, hating every second, wanted to get out of there. And I see the waitress coming towards me. And I prayed, I said, Lord Jesus, please, please, no, no, don't let that girl give me that, 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 that bill. And the blonde girl who wanted to win my heart said, I'll take it. I said, Lord, bless that girl. <laughs> she said, I'll take the bill, wanting to win me, you know, wanted to, so I can marry her and pay attention to her. I said, Lord, bless the girl, but I still am not going to marry her. <laughs> bless, bless her. And she paid the bill. And now I go back home. Nearly on empty in my car. I used to have a red, white Pontiac. No gas almost in it. Monday morning, I go to the, to the office with trembling, thinking this is the last day in the ministry. And Marianne Robinson said, there's, a, there's an envelope that came from Bill Pranker. I said, oh, no, he's going to tell me off in writing. I said, he told me off already one time in my face. Now he want to tell me off in writing. But it was the only letter that came that morning. So I nervously opened the letter. Bishop Don, inside that envelope was a note that said, God told me to give you $1,000, and I don't know why. <laughs> Very nasty. Not even a nice note. It didn't even say nothing. God told me to give you, and I don't know why. Bill. And I'm thinking, this is a miracle. This man just gave me $1,000? Are you kidding? That week, Envelope after envelope after envelope after envelope after envelope that said, God told me to send this. I was out of debt in six months. Wait, hold, hold. The, the bills to the network were paid completely. I was shocked. I mean, big time shocker. And I'm thinking, oh, Roy is right. Those board members wanted to come back now. Those seven boys wanted to come back. I said, no, if you did not believe God spoke to me then, you will not believe later, so bye-bye. And I'm telling that was my first lesson about obeying the law of God. That was 1979. So it's been a, quite, a, quite a history. And then Oral Roberts, amazing Oral Roberts, came to preach for me in 85, 84, 85. He's sitting behind me, he said, uh, after service, he said, can I talk to you like my son? I said, sure. He said, you're a lousy offering taker. He said, you're lousy when it comes to taking an offering. Why? He said, all you focused on today is the seed. He said, Jesus focused on the harvest. And then he took me to Luke 6. That was another life-changing moment for me. He took me to Luke 6.38. He said, read it. So I read it. We all, we all know it by heart. Give it shall be given unto you good measure and all that. He said, Jesus said to receive the, to expect the harvest seven times in this verse. I said, where? He took my hand. He grabbed my hand and began pulling my fingers. And he said, it shall be given unto you good measure. Press down, shake it together, run over, shall man give to your bosom. I said, do that again. <laughs> seven times. It shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give to your bosom. I said, wow, I didn't ever saw it before. He said, the Lord focus on the harvest, not the seed. All you focus on this morning is the seed. Focus on the harvest, he said. I said, what do I do from here on? He said, tell your people to focus on the harvest and let them ask God to bless them financially. And then he hit me with a big one. He said, what do you want financially from God? I said, well, I really never, never thought about it. He said, what do you want from God financially? He said, you pray for all kinds of things. You pray for healing and this and this and that. Have you ever told God what you want financially? I said, no, no. Why don't you? I never really thought about it. So finally he said, well, what do you want from God financially? I said, well... Sue and I just bought a home, and we'd like to pay it off. He said, well, do you tell God that? 
And I said, okay. He said, no, no, now. You tell God now. So I prayed, and I wasn't praying in faith. And, oh, you know, Lord, just, just to please him, you know, just to make him go home. <laughs> or so we can all go home. I mean, well, I, I, I honored Oral tremendously, but it was very long morning, and I was physically tired. We had to come back Sunday night for another service, and I thought, you know, one would go take, take, take a nap. The next Sunday, I got up in church. Nervously, I said to the crowd, how many of you have debt, and you want God to take care of it, whatever it is? Well, the whole place put, put it up. Now, Oral had said to me that Sunday before, he said, not only should you should tell God, write it on the, on the, on the, on the envelope. He said, because when you write it, faith doubles. He said that. He said, when you write it down, your faith kind of doubles up. It becomes stronger. So I wrote on my envelope, Lord, I want to pay off the house. We just bought one for 300000 that back then. And every Sunday, I would write the same thing. Lord, I want to pay off the house. And put the offering in. Tie the offering. One Sunday morning, a few months later, he said, I heard the Lord say, do you believe it? I said, yes. He said, praise me for it. I said, Lord, I praise you. The, the house is paid off. I did that every Sunday morning. A man, Emil Tannis, his wife, Joyce, now Sue will remember, used to wear her hair like the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> she was a blonde woman, and her hair would go way up like that. She would put a big piece of jewelry on top of the hair. And that thing would be moving like this. She, I'm not kidding you. So then, am I right? Yeah. She'd come down the aisle, guys, and, and that thing was doing this up there. And you thought it could just come flying off. She had a big rock, whatever it was, some kind of crystal thing she'd wear. And one day I said, Joyce, if you ever go swimming, you'll drown. I said, you are so much jewelry, you're going to drown. So she kind of dismissed me. So her husband takes me out for dinner with Suzanne. She, she, she was there. He said, the Lord, Linda, he said, the Lord spoke to my wife and I to give you this, an envelope. I opened that envelope, 300000 in that envelope. The, wait, the exact amount to pay off the house. He said, the Lord told us to give you this, and we both began crying. We paid off the house like that. And I'm thinking, Oral is right. Amen. He is because of the wonderful man of God. I'm here to tell you tonight, God will do it again for you. Amen. If you believe that, lift your hands and say, I believe it, Lord. I believe it, Lord. Now, so time after time in Scripture, I wish above all things you prosper, be in health. We got to believe it. Give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake it up. Running over shall men, we got to believe it. So there's three keys that I've discovered in 48 years of ministry to, to prosperity. Three keys. Key number one is in Proverbs 8. I will cause them that love me to inherit substance. I will cause them that love me to inherit substance. This is in Proverbs chapter 8. So when you love the Lord... He promises substance. And you know that God's word is repeatedly telling us, if you honor the Lord with your substance, he'll bless you. God is big when it comes to honor. In, 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 in our culture, same thing. Honor is headline, big headline. You, you honor your parents, you honor your your, your elders, and so forth. To honor the Lord with your substance is highly important in His sight. Amen. Honor the Lord with thy substance and the first fruits of all your increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and your presses will burst out, not just come out, burst out with new wine. That is His word. That's His law. You can't change that. Law number two, the second key is Job 22. It says if you love, it says get acquainted with God and be at peace with him. It says receive the law from his mouth, receive his word from his mouth. 
And then it says, you'll have gold and silver. You'll have plenty of blessings. Meaning the word of God is the second key. That's in Job 22. You can look it up. Years ago, a French man put the verses in the Bible, and an Englishman before him divided the Bible into chapters. At least I'm giving you the chapter, so just go look it up. Huh? Proverbs 8 and Job 22. The third, the third key is obedience. Job 36, it says, if they obey, if they obey and serve him, they'll spend their days in prosperity and years in pleasure. Obedience is the tough one. Obedience is where people have a problem with. They all say, yes, I love Jesus. They all obey Proverbs 8, and they all obey Job 22, but nobody wants to obey Job 36. Obey him. So when God speaks, do it. Don't negotiate. Don't negotiate. And it's going to hurt. It will hurt you. I promise you, you you're not going to feel good. You're going to feel pain. He that goeth forth spreading seed, weeping, it says. That's pain. So nobody sows big seed laughing. Big seed means you're going to cry about it. You're going to complain. It's okay. God understands. But he'll prove it to you over and over and over in your life that that seed works. Absolutely works. So I'm going to have you do something tonight. You've got an envelope somewhere. You've got envelopes for, for, for other people. Okay. Now you're going to take this envelope. And on the back of it, you're going to write, Lord, I praise you that my financial whatever, be specific tonight. Don't, don't just say prosperity. Now, what is it you really want financially? You've got to be very specific with God. I've learned that about the Lord. He answers only specific prayers. Be specific with God. Is it your house? Is it your car? Is it your bills next week? Is it a lawsuit you're fighting? What is it financially? Don't write on the back of the envelope, Lord, heal me. Uh-uh, you cannot pay for healing. That is insulting to God. I repeat, you cannot give financial seed for spiritual results. Did you hear that? Yes. You, you cannot buy a miracle. That's only foolishness. God will not pay attention to that prayer. You, you can't write, Lord, heal my mother. No, it's not going to work. You can't pay for miracles. You only are going to sow for financial results. Miracles, uh, uh, when God heals you physically, all it takes is faith. Not money, just faith. Nobody paid Jesus money for a miracle. They just said, Lord, I believe. That's it. Nobody gave money for salvation. That's an insult to God. Because I've heard people say, well, if you give for souls, God will save your loved ones. That's not in the Bible. You, go, you don't give money for the salvation of souls. Or that your children be saved. Yes, you can support the gospel. Of course you can. But, but you, you're not paying for miracles. Spiritually, it's impossible. It's an insult to God. So when you give, you focus only on the financial need. Only on the financial. Look, this is after 48 years of learning it, okay? You focus on the financial. Lord, I need a house. Or I need to pay off the house. Or I need a car. Or I need to pay off the car. Or I need whatever. Financially. And I want you to write that prayer. Or better than, than that, just say, Lord, I praise you that I'm going to receive it. You may even want to write both, prayer and praise at the same one. David prayed for prosperity when he said, Lord, send prosperity now. We pray that God, I did not know that till Oral Roberts said, why don't you ask God? You ask him for everything else. And then you need to sow a seed that fits the need. You sow a seed that fits the need. If you need a big 
harvest, you sow a big seed. If you want a small harvest, you give a small seed. If we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. We sow bountifully, we reap bountifully. We also reap bountifully. So a lady came up one day, she said, well, how much should I give? I said, what do you need? What do you need? You need to just uh, something small? Well, then sow small. But if you need something big from God, you have to sow a big seed. That's quite simple, really. So, Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray you'll bless your people tonight financially. And what you've done for me over and over, do for them. And Lord, I thank you for your promises. I thank you for your promises. You, you said it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give to your bosom. And when we honor you, Lord, you said our barns will be filled with plenty. We give you the praise. Do what God says and watch the results. It will be amazing the results. And the miracle happens always on time. So once you've sown that seed, I want to agree with you. Can we come into agreement? Can we come into agreement? Okay. Can you stretch your hands towards me? I'm stretching my hands towards you. Come on. Let's just come into agreement. Let's just say, Lord, Father, in Jesus' name, we agree according to your word. For you said, if two will agree, it'll be done. And we agree, Lord, the seed we sow today will bring the needed harvest. We expect it, and we thank you for it. And we praise you for your love, for your care. Wonderful Jesus, thank you for taking care of us and taking care of this need in my life today. This financial need, we agree, is met in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay. So... You can probably give also online. I see it's up there for you. You can do the same thing online. Or credit card. Yeah, but that could take too long. Okay? That, that, maybe they can do it later. It'll be much quicker if we just write it from the screen. Please. That, because otherwise it could take too long and we, people would lose interest in the service. They'll get too tired. Okay? If that's okay. Yeah, good. So just write it down on your, on your envelope, or you can do it on your phone. So much simpler, so much simpler. Just do it on your phone. Send the offering on your phone or text it, or just simply give it, and so forth. Okay. You can zell it on your phone right now. You can do zell or PayPal right from your seat. All right. So... I, I, I can't hear what you said. Come, come and tell them because I, I, I can't hear what, what, what you're saying to me. Oh, and those online, thank you very, very much. Those of you online, the information is there for you right online. Okay, beautiful. All right, can we go ahead and uh, pass the offering buckets? You have the offering buckets here, I'm sure. Ushers, can you go ahead and pass the offering buckets? No, no. I don't want anyone coming up and putting them here. It takes too long. Just pass the offering from one person to another. And there's the buckets. Okay, good. Yeah, I do it the old-fashioned way. I like the old-fashioned way. As the people come up, they want to talk to you, and there's no time for that. Okay, just pass the offering buckets, please. Lord, I love you, and I worship you. You are worthy to be praised. Lord, I love you, and I worship you.
turn this on so I can look at the clock and not go beyond a certain time so people can all right do not turn my phone on keep it on plane mode I just want, want to see the clock so I can yeah thank you and uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. I'll be back here thank you Greg I'll be back here to minister on the anointing you can't miss tomorrow afternoon we really need to understand the anointing I just wrote a book called on the, on the mysteries of the anointing and it's selling real good I don't know if I want to talk about that fully but I really want to minister on the anointing because I really want you to understand it so God can use you let me hear an amen. amen and I also want to talk about the fact that God uses imperfect vessels and how to place yourself in that place where God will look on you with favor and use you okay so I'm gonna wait till you're all done in the in the back and dear Bishop Don I'm going to be with you this Sunday morning at 10. At 10. So that's this Sunday morning, I'll be at Bishop Don Muir's church, which is, and then Sunday night too. So can you give them the address? Upper Marlboro, Maryland. We're right across from Six Flags. You can't miss it. Oh, the street address, 13901 Central Avenue. It's going to be a very powerful Sunday. We've actually promoted it quite a lot. And this will be a BHM event in his building Sunday night, Sunday night. Sunday morning I'm preaching for him, which I rarely do anymore. To get me into a Sunday morning service is almost impossible. I do it for my children reluctantly. But when Bishop Don said, I could not say no because we go way back we go way back and uh, physically it's not easy for me you know to get up in the morning and then go back at night again it's kind of a little tough but for him I do anything all right so are you ready to receive the word yes. lift lift your hands to heaven now Lord I thank you for what you're going to say through this message and I pray you'll quicken my mind to say it just right. Quicken my heart also, Lord. And quicken the people's hearts and minds to receive it, to understand it. For we need to understand it more than a year ago or two years ago. We need it now. This is a, a now word for your people. We give you all the praise. And God's people said, Amen. Okay. Okay, sir, come. Let's finish up. Let's finish up. I want to make sure we're all done before I minister the word. Okay. So, now, can, can they take the offering somewhere else? Oh, okay, good. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you, Greg. We are dealing today with a generation that questions the reliability of scripture and for the first few moments I want to just answer some questions and give you something to believe and something to understand now this is not my message my message is on, on mortifying the deeds of the body but it's important I think for you because many of you have children young people that have a lot of questions or they are questioned about the Bible. My grandson, 15-year-old Benny, they call him after my name, is very witty, very smart kid. He's reading Josephus. He's so smart, that kid. He's only 15 years old, reading Josephus. And he asked me a question a few days ago. It was quite eye-opening. He said, he, they call me Dada. Dada, 
What do I tell my friends that question the Bible in school? I said, what school do you go to? I should have known. He goes to a school called, uh, it's a Christian school at a church called One Church. One Church. Are we all done with the offering, my dear? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say a word till, it, till it's done. No, yeah, that's it? Okay. I don't give the word if people are still doing whatever. It's distracting and it's harmful. Okay, you're all done now? Nobody move now, thank you very much. Okay. All right, let me continue. So I said to my grandson, I said, you can tell your friends, give them a few facts, because these young people today are being, uh, are being, how shall I say that? I think many, many of them are confused. They're being lied to by people they look up to about the Bible. So let's just understand just a few things about the Bible. The Word of God is so reliable, so reliable, that what you have to look at, first of all, that's most important is one question that you ask yourself or ask people. Ask them, how many prophecies are in religious books outside Christianity? Whatever religion out there. How many prophecies are in those books? Zero. There's zero prophecies in any religion outside Christianity or Judaism. So, anything outside Christianity, their books, whatever books they call them, have no prophecy whatsoever. Why? Because they know if one of them is not fulfilled, the whole religion is over. And then I said to my grandson, ask your friends how many prophecies are in the Bible? Most Christians don't know this, but I'll tell you. 2,500. 2,500 prophecies are in the Bible. How many of them have been fulfilled? I said to him. You ask your friends, do they know how many have been fulfilled? 2,000. Now the chances of 2,000 prophecies being fulfilled is humanly impossible. In fact, they say, not even three. If even three were fulfilled, it's humanly impossible. But God went way beyond to give us 2,500 prophecies, and 2,000 have been fulfilled in detail. So the chances of the extra 500 to be fulfilled about the second coming of the Lord and the millennium reign and the restoration of Israel are very high to be fulfilled because 2,000 already are fulfilled. Now, number two, number two, God did not depend only because he knows the mind of men. God knew that people would still question the Bible. So God gave us historical evidence. For those that don't believe the Bible, who say they're atheists or whatever, which is so foolish anyways, he gave us historical evidence. So the question is, how many documents out there talk about Caesar, Augustus Caesar, that many universities teach that he existed? But how many documents are there out there historically? Nine. Less than ten. How many historical documents talk about Jesus, the Son of God? 39. 39. Nobody questions the existence of Augustus Caesar, but Jesus, 39 historical documents written by the majority of those who wrote them were actually atheists that did research historical research, and they discovered documents in history that talk about a man named Jesus, 
that many believed was the Son of God who died and rose from the dead. Even Josephus talks about Jesus, the greatest Jewish historian of his day. And many such documents that you can walk into your library tomorrow and find them. But God went way beyond history. He went into archaeology. Because he knew man is so hard-minded. His brain doesn't always think right and hard-hearted. They really need to look at something right there in front of them. Today, Israeli archaeologists use only one book for archaeology, the Bible. No other book but the Bible. The Bible has become the only book Israeli archaeologists follow. I've been to locations that you'd like to go, I'm sure, and walk in, like the city of David. I was there. I was there when they discovered the steps that went up from the Pool of Siloam to Temple Mount. I was in there digging with them. The dirt. I was there when the steps were discovered, mentioned in the book of Ezra. With my own eyes and my own hand, I picked up coins from the dirt. 2,000-year-old coins. And much more. There's no question in archaeology about the Bible. And these are not believers. They're unbelievers in Jesus. They're not born-again people. But they will tell you that the Bible is so accurate, they use it as the roadmap for archaeology. So today's church doesn't know that. Now, we believers do not need archaeology to be convinced. We don't need history either. The proof we have is prophecy. How can, how can God, God Almighty only would, but think about how can it be that a, a prophecy can be so detailed that was written hundreds of years before its fulfillment in details, in details. God telling Abraham about Israel going to Egypt and how long they'd, they'd be there. Hundreds of years before they went. Or give the names of certain individuals like King Josiah, who wasn't even born yet, that he would come and burn the bones of the priests that offered offerings to idols, which he did. Today you can walk the Holy Land and see the places. I've been to the Valley of Elah, you haven't, where David fought Goliath. And the Bible says he took a rock out of the brook, and I took the rock out of the same brook. It's still there. I was doing a promise. That here's the same brook, and here's rocks right there. And David found one of them too. But we believers, we don't even need to go see. We just need to know prophecy. 332 prophecies fulfilled just about the Lord's first coming in detail. In detail. Amazing details. So make sure you share this and make sure to get to know your Bible because the problem today is people just don't read the Bible. The problem is they don't know what it says. All right, now, having said all that, let me get into my message. Romans 8, verse 12 through 14. This is really my message for you tonight, but I gave you this little appetizer early to help you with your kids and friends. Or maybe you yourself need that information. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh 
to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, or put to death, the deeds of the body ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. All right. I want to focus on verse 13 for a minute here. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. This is a most important and searching verse. And I want to show you five things that caught my attention when I read it. The five things that will catch your attention when you read verse 13 is, number one, the person that, uh, that he's talking to. Who is he talking to? Number two, the frightening warning. Number three, the duty of the listener. Number four, the helper provided. And number five, the promise of keeping it. So let's look at it one more time and see those five things. For if ye, ye, who's the ye? So who is he talking to? No, wait, no, wait, you got to say more than that. To, to know who he's talking to, you go, you've got to go back to verse 1. There's now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, after the spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So, it says clearly he's talking to a believer. And then in verse 2, a believer. How about verse 4? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, us believers, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And then you look at verse 5 and 6. It says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the, the, spirit, the, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. So he's still talking to the believer. And then you go to verse 12, again, the believer, for he says, therefore, brethren, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. So in verse 13, when he says, for if ye, he's talking to us. Number two, there's a frightening warning in verse 13. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's the warning. Now, the duty of you that are listening, but he says, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify. If you through the Spirit do mortify. So it's your duty to mortify the flesh. And then, number four, he talks about the Spirit. So there you see the helper that God has provided. And number five, the promise given is, ye shall live. So, let's read the verse again. If you, believer, live after the flesh, you'll die. So he's talking to believer, giving you a warning. You'll die. But if you through the Spirit will mortify, it's your duty to mortify the deeds of the body you live. So what is so important is, is the fact that he tells us it is, it's possible to go back to death. It's possible to lose the life we're living in. So, he says to you and me who have known life in Jesus, you will die if you choose to live after the flesh. Now, in verse 12, he makes a very powerful statement. He says, brethren, you don't owe the flesh a thing. 
Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. So we believers are debtors to God. We owe God everything. We owe the flesh nothing. Why do we owe God everything? Because, well, He gave us life. He gave us His Spirit. So Jesus is the one who has given us what we have today as believers. We owe Him our being. We owe Him our existence. We owe Him our all. And therefore, He has absolute priority over our lives. Jesus has absolute priority over our lives. Why? He bought us. We are His. He bought us. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6 and see what it says about this purchase He made. For it says, Know ye not, verse 19, What? Know ye not? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which belong to God. You don't owe the flesh anything because God bought you with his own blood. In Ephesians 2, verse 10, it says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are his creation. So having bought us from death, having renewed us in life, and continues to renew us into his image, making us sons and daughters, we owe him our life, our strength, and our service. I'm going to show you something really quite powerful in Luke. Luke 17, verse 10. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. This tells me something powerful. Our obedience to God is a debt we owe him. Our obedience to God is a debt we owe him. For it says, likewise ye... When ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, you need to say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. So our obedience to God is a debt we owe him. I love what it says in in 2 Corinthians 5, and I'm going to read verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. So he demands our life. We owe him our life. We owe him our strength. We owe him our service. We owe him our obedience. Because the love of Jesus constrains us because we thus judge. If he died for us, we die for him. That, and it says in verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, 
but unto him who died for them and rose again. It's powerful. So we go back to Romans 8.12 that says, Brethren, you don't owe the flesh anything. You should not give the flesh anything. Now, I'm going to read that again because it's so important to see the Scripture more than once. And such a message needs to be repeated because people are not catching everything you're saying. Brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Now, there's something very important I'm going to say here. There's a big difference between being in the flesh and living after the flesh. Look, look at me. <laughs> right here. A big difference between in the flesh, after the flesh. In the flesh means you're not even saved. After the flesh means you're saved and you go backwards. Because now you went back in that old life. So it is possible to lose life and die again. He says so clearly in Romans 8.13. If you live after the flesh, you will die. So what we need to do today is pay attention to Galatians 6, 8. Galatians 6, 8 is a big headline warning for every one of us sitting in this room. You've read it. I'm sure you heard it. It says, He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now, now can, can, can you look at me a minute? Yeah. People that sow to the flesh are people that watch too much television. They are too involved in worldly matters. I made a decision in about 2014, I think, 2014, 2015. Well, the Lord, I'm sitting watching TV. And the Lord says to me, cancel this subscription. I was watching Netflix. He said, cancel it. So I called the fellow that worked in our ministry called Lance, who knew this stuff. I said, you can cancel this thing. I don't know how to do it. Then the Lord said, cancel Direct TV. I did. Cancel cable. I did. You can't watch network TV in my place. It doesn't even come through because there's nothing. And I decided that I would spend my evenings in the scriptures. It changed my life. No, I'm not bored. I love it. Those programs bore me, yes. Not the Bible. And I decided to, to learn Hebrew. So I registered to be a student of Hebrew University to learn the Bible. And for three years, that's all I did. And, I, and my professor was a brilliant woman that from Hebrew University... Sigal Zohar, her name, she is brilliant. She's not a believer, but boy, she knows Hebrew. And I began reading my Hebrew Bible. I grew up in Israel, but I didn't know it that good. But when I went to that three-year course of that university, which I finished, by the way, she told me I was the best student in the class. 
We had a guy, we had a guy come, we had a guy come a few days ago named Eitan, brilliant uh, man from Israel. And I, when I read him the Bible in Hebrew, he said, I'm very impressed. In fact, Chad was right there and heard him tell me, he said, you read real good. I said, yeah, I, I had to learn it the hard way. But really, the Hebrew Bible has opened a new door for me to understand Scripture and the depth of Scripture. And then I really got into church history when I had more time. I have read Fox's Book of Martyrs now four times. It changes your life when you read about the martyrs that paid with their blood for the faith you and I love and, and, and live in. It's wonderful reading about these men, women, who died for the faith, praising the Lord, burning in the fire. You begin to ask yourself, am I a Christian? Can I, like John has, sing praise, burning? Can I suffer like William Tyndale and praise the Lord for it? They burnt him? For translating the Bible in English? Can I really praise the Lord if they killed my baby for learning the Lord's Prayer in English? That happened in England. They killed a little girl for learning how to pray the Lord's Prayer in English. That's history. And you just, your whole look on life changes. I don't even, I don't even identify with Benny and pre-2014. I just don't identify with them. I was somewhere else, I guess. Suddenly, whoo, the whole world has changed. And I have made a decision. I will finish better than when I began. Wait, wait, wait. For one reason, I know him better. Through his word, his word, his word, his word. The devil likes to bring the past up. He's just a, nothing but a liar. We focus on tomorrow. We focus on the future. We focus on where we are in Jesus and get deeper, simple. And not allow the distractions of life to pull us back. Including family. They're not going to stand next to you and say, well, please be easy on Benny. You pay the price. We only have one soul here, one, one life to live. And nobody's going to be next to you defending you on that day. And your tears on that day will mean nothing. You start repenting now, not then. So it says, don't sow to the flesh. The more you sow, the more you die. Stop watching that garbage. Amen. Stop listening to those things that are, are destroying you on the, from the inside out. And I'm going to be really blunt here. You won't like this, but I don't care. Stop being so political. Stop being so political. God never called you to be involved in politics. Jesus is all you need. He's the only one you need. I know some of you don't like it. Yeah, it's okay. I'm not your pastor. I don't have to see you next, next week. I'm just telling you, stop being distracted by worldly matters. Focus on your soul and your real, the real need in your life, the presence of the Lord in your life. Look, look, when you start losing your hunger, you're dying. There's three things in Christianity that says you're alive. Number one, hunger for the Lord. Number two, faith in his promises. Number three, love for the Lord. The minute you lose your hunger, you're sick. 
in, I mean, in the flesh, in the flesh. What do people lose first when they get sick physically? Appetite. What do you lose first as a Christian when you're sick spiritually? Hunger. Your appetite for the Lord, for His Word. Knowledge of the Lord. You don't want to even bother with it. What do you lose then? Okay, let's talk about in the natural. What are the three things that says a baby is alive? Number one, he's hungry. Number two, he knows this is mommy. And this is daddy. This is family. Faith is born in that little baby by knowing this is my mother without even being able to talk. And then next thing you see, that baby starts to love you. It doesn't know you all the way, but they begin to love you. Three things happen to us when we're saved. First, we become hungry for the Lord. Two, we believe we're saved. We believe his word. Supernaturally, we don't have to listen to Hagen or Copeland to believe it. We just know that he loves us. And we know we are saved and we belong to him without even knowing what preachers are saying out there. That's called faith. Amen. And the third thing we amazingly discover is we love somebody we've never seen. Well, that's not natural. That's supernatural. That you love someone you've never seen before. 2,000 year, years ago, they saw him and did not love him Today we have not seen him and love him. Amen. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, not the work of the flesh. Amen. So when you're hungry for Jesus, that means you're alive. When you believe what he says, you're alive. When you love him, having not seen him, you're alive. But when you start dying, you lose what? Your hunger. You don't want to even bother with reading the Bible. What else do you lose? Your faith. You begin to question what he says. And number three, your heart gets cold. Then you're dying. So what are, what are you doing spending your time with things that are destroying you? Destroying you on the inside. And then they're going to destroy you on the outside. Stop it. Stop watching those programs. Stop reading those magazines. Stop reading those books. Get to know your Savior. Spend time with him in his word. He'll reveal his scriptures. He'll reveal his word that you'll be weeping just reading. And your love will grow. Once your, once your hunger is back, you know, Alive, your faith will live and your love will live and grow, 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 grow till his love will consume you. It's precious. And then his reality will take over your life. But Paul is warning us, he said, don't sow to the flesh. Don't ignore the Lord and his word and be watching all this worldly stuff. What did Paul say to to Timothy, he, he said, a soldier of Jesus will not entangle himself in the affairs of this life. Did you hear that? Tell me what I just said. A soldier of Jesus will not entangle himself in the affairs of this life. That's what Paul wrote. That's for you too and me too. Are you listening? Good. The Lord has warned us in Luke 11.35. And you see these warnings in the Bible. It says this. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you does not become dark. Or darkness. That's a, that's a, that's a scary one. Be careful that the light in you does not become darkness in you. So if you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption, and the light goes, and the, and, and the old darkness comes back. 
You don't want that. It's not how you start that matters. It's how you finish. And it's not how you fall that matters. It's how you get up. Did you hear that? It doesn't matter how you fall. How do you get up? We all have had our slip here and slip there. Come on. We, well, me too. Everybody's had some turbulence in life. You almost destroyed yourself. Then you wake up. You become strong and go on. Go on. So... The word flesh, by the way, in Scripture, and there's other warnings like Luke 17, 32. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife? How she looked back? When you read the word flesh in Scripture, it speaks of that corrupt nature which is in each one of us when we were born as babies. Transmitted from one parent to a child. And by the way, it was not in Adam. God did not create him with that corrupt nature. He chose it. Because when God created Adam, he said, very good. Well, you don't say very good to something corrupt. So the, the answer to what happened to Adam, how come he messed up? It's found in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 7.29. It says, God made man or created man upright, but he sought in many inventions. God created man upright. When God created Adam, he was holy, clean, and good. But he sought him inventions. He looked for, ah, oh, I like that. Mm, let's look at this one. So, sadly, Adam gave in to the flesh, the enemy of holiness. The flesh is enmity against God, the Bible says. Right. Romans 8, 7. Enmity against God. There's a big difference between an enemy and enmity. You can reconcile with an enemy. You cannot reconcile with an enmity. Satan is enmity against God. He's the very source of enmity. The Bible says the flesh is enmity against God. It cannot reconcile with him. The flesh, that irreconcilable enemy of holiness, the devil, the world, enmity against God, so the flesh, please hear this, the flesh is the womb where all sin is conceived and formed. And I just told you earlier the difference between in the flesh and after the, the flesh. In the flesh is outside the kingdom. Romans 7, 5 talks about people in the flesh. For in Romans 7, 5, he says, we were in the flesh. We were back then. When we were in the flesh. We were not in the kingdom. We were in the flesh. That's in Romans 7, verse 5. If you want to know, just know the difference. For when we were in the flesh, he says, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit to death. And it says, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, 8. So to live after the flesh means you are saved, but you've gone backwards, and now you conduct your life and begin to do the old things you did. You become dominated by the fallen nature. To, to, to live after the flesh means... You become governed again by the evil nature. You become governed again by the evil nature. Are, is this getting through to you? Yes. And people that go after the flesh, 
the glory of God becomes nothing to them and the flesh becomes everything to them. And so we're commanded in Romans 6, 12. I'm almost done. I've got to get this through to you. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Can I have my phone back so I know what time it is? Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. So this is a matter of life and death because he says in verse 16 of Romans 6, Don't you know, know ye not, to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? So this is a matter of life and death. And that's why it says, if you live after the flesh, you'll die. You know, the Bible in Revelation 21, verse 8, talks about the second death. The fearful, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, homemongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Paul cries, cried that he would, he would be raised from the dead in the, in the first resurrection. That, that's, that the second death will, will have no power then. Okay. So it's time for you and I to obey Colossians. Please, some beautiful music behind me. I'm almost done. Do you, do you sweet people, want to make heaven and see the smile of the Lord on his face? I'm going to give you the answer. Mortify Colossians, Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate or passions, evil affections, and evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify them, put them to death. How? Starve them. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. So, how do I do that? He says to us, mortify therefore your members. Mortify your members means make no provision for the flesh. Yeah, thank God is right. Because we have the power to say no. In Romans 13, 14, Paul tells us, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So I cannot starve the flesh till I put on the Lord Jesus. So put on the Lord Jesus and then don't make provision for the flesh. Say no to it. Mm -mm, I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to do this. No, 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 no. That's not my life anymore. We deny it completely. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a war. If you want to walk in the spirit, you have to starve the flesh. Quite simple. And Paul in Galatians 5 says, it's a war inside of you. It's fine. So have no fellowship. Ephesians 5, 11 says, have no fellowship this is an important verse you all ought to underline and remember. I'm going to read very Ephesians 5, 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't look at them, but expose them. 
So now, do you remember what it says I gave you earlier, Romans 8.13, right? Can we go back to it and read it together out loud? I want to I point some one thing out to you before I say I'm done, okay? I want to point one thing out to you with that, about that verse. So we, we, we're going to read it together. Let's read it out loud, all of us. One, two, three, let's go. For if ye after the flesh ye shall die, but if... Stop, stop. If ye through what? It doesn't say the Spirit through you. It says you through Him. If you through the Spirit, meaning you start first. You act first. If you through the Spirit, not the Spirit through you, so we are the ones that act, and He enables. Say, I act, He empowers. Say it again. One more time. So the second you act, He gives you the power to do it. Because that's what it says. If you, through the Spirit, you act, the Spirit empowers do mortify the deeds of the body, you live. So Lord, I cannot do it, but I decide today, I will not look, I will not entertain the world. And Lord, I make that decision, now empower me to live it. And every day you ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And finally, one final scripture, and I truly am done. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Wow. So, we decide it. He empowers us to live it. The highway of holiness is the only path to heaven. Lift your hands to heaven. Now, Lord, I gave them your word. As clearly as I could, as well as I could. And I'm trusting you to help them live it. Help me live it. Help all of us live it. We've made the decision already, all of us. Our decision is firm. We have decided to follow you. No turning back. We know the dangers of the lust of the eye lust of the flesh and the part of life. We don't want to make that mistake again. Thank you for your love and mercy that we're still here, that we can still go on and become stronger. Your word says, when my foot slipped, your mercy held me up. Thank you for that mercy. Thank you for your love. song. I'm going to sing it as a commitment. Lift your hands. Come on. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's it. Turning back. One more time, you're singing it to him. I have decided.
the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. Though none go with Yet will I follow Though none go with me Yet I will follow Though none go with me Yet I will follow No turning back Now just gently with eyes closed I have decided Scribe honor to thee, we ascribe glory to thee, we ascribe honor. Whisper so exalt, so exalt, lift up on high. Jesus. 
and make us clean. Who is perfect? You are perfect. All have failed and all have sinned. Only you are glorious and perfect in all your ways. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross, taking our filth and misery and darkness. Thank you. Thank you for willfully, lovingly, enduring the cause for the joy that you saw. Thank you for undeserving sinners. Yet you set your love upon us. Chosen in you before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless and I cry again with your scripture your word unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you blameless before his throne the joy the joy to the only wise God Who are we, Lord? Who are we? That we should be called your children. Who are we? Like David would say, who am I? Who is my father's house? Thank you for your love. That you chose us when we did not know you. You died for us when we lived in sin. Thank you, blessed Lord for saving us, for searching for us and finding us. We did not find you, you found us. You loved us before we knew your name. Thank you. Keep us as the apple of the eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings from the wicked, from the wicked one. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit, for making the Lord so real. And glory. For you are glory. 
His wonderful presence is here. receive your healing. The presence of the Lord is here. Those of you sick in body, place your hand on that sickness. As I pray, the Lord's going to touch you. Lord, heal your people. I rebuke that sickness. I rebuke that pain. In Jesus' name. Lord declares you wound for our transgressions, bruise for our iniquities, chastise for our peace. With your stripes were healed. Heal your people, Lord. I rebuke that sickness. I rebuke that infirmity. Lift your hands to receive your Jesus, your glory. Some of you feel tremendous warmth on your body. Just lift your hands to receive your healing. Someone with a neck injury in the back has just been healed. If you move your neck, it was hurting you earlier. Now the pain is gone. An infection in someone's skin. A lot of pain in your skin. You've had a lot of pain. You, you're on medication for it. You feel a beautiful presence, an anointing of the Lord on your body, like a, like a warmth, a gentle warmth. Probably right now. You feel as though you're enveloped in the love of Jesus. Someone with an infection in your right eye, just recently you began having trouble with it. The Lord is healing you now. Thank you, Lord. Asthma is being healed and arthritis in someone's hip. 
just, just, just begin praying out loud in the Holy Ghost. Somebody with a tumor. Would you check it out? It's gone. Somebody's kneecap, your right knee, your right knee. You've had a pain in your right knee. Yes, Lord, thank you for the beautiful healing. Somebody's circulation has just been healed. Somebody's circulation is being healed. A heart condition also is being healed. heart condition has just been healed. Many of you are sensing the power of God on your body. I don't have to call out every, every healing, so pray in the Holy Ghost out loud quickly. I don't have to call out every, every healing. Another problem with somebody's skin is being healed. Lift your hands and pray just for another minute or two. And those of you that are being healed, just Come out of your seat. If you know that God has healed you, yes, if you know God has healed you, come out of your seat and line up over here to the left. Well, just to my left. As everyone pr keep praying, pray in the spirit. If you know that God has touched you physically, in the last few moments, some of you began to sense the power of God on your body. I would ask you now just to check it out. See what's... What, 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 what has changed in your in your body there is a lot of beautiful healings taking place here thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord now just line up over there on the left and begin to check them out quickly please and Suzanne you can come help me honey over here People, can you lift your hands and pray for just a few more minutes? Bring that lady up. What happened to her? What happened to her? Well, just check it out first before you bring her up. Bring her up here. Bring her up here. I'll pray for her. If God has healed you, just you go to the side here. Nobody come up on the platform, please, unless we need you up here. What happened to you, darling? Yeah, yes, Lord, thanks. Every, every, every better. Every better. Every better. In Jesus' name. What happened to you? MS, come here. The pain is gone. All right. Take your seats. Take your seats. Lord, let every bit of it go. In the name of Jesus, it goes. Help him up. Can, can you help him up? We need somebody to help us over here. Help her, help her back. Help her back. Just for a few more minutes, I'm going to pray for the people. That's it. We're not going to stay too long with this. Help her down. All right, so what, what, what happened to you? Okay, so that mic is not working. No, 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 I need that mic with you because, uh, yeah. The sharp pain, okay. Lord, every, every bit of it, thank you. Oh, every bit of it goes in Jesus' mighty name. Every bit of it goes. What happened to you? Lord, every bit of that pain leaves that neck. In the Lord, thank you in the glorious name of Jesus. What happened to the gentleman? Lord, every bit of it will not come back. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Your mercies are great, Lord. Your mercies are great, Lord. Mercies are great, Lord. What happened to her? Every bit of the arthritis leaves in Jesus' name. And thank you, Lord, for your grace on God. 
Breathing issues and pain, the pain is totally gone and she can breathe. We need people, just one more person. Lord, thank you. To you be the glory. You will bless it. Experience with you, Lord. Thanks for that healing. Everybody that goes. What happened to her? She had pain in her neck and her right knee, and the pain is totally gone from her neck Jesus, her thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your great mercy and grace. Sweet Jesus, I worship you, Lord. Chest, neck, and ankle pain, the pain is totally gone tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You never come back. In Jesus' name, never come back, Lord. I want you all to stand. And uh, please stand, will you? Because I want to... Okay, let this be the last one. Because I, I... Go, go, go. Gills burns and the pain is totally gone. And she's had it for six months. Thank you, Lord. For your amazing love and power. Meet that need in your holy name. Meet that need, Lord. For your mercy is great on this woman. Yeah. Every bed, every bed, every bed, every bed, every bed. Bring that lady in the blue or the purple. It's okay, it's okay. The light is for five years and the, the Lord has touched her tonight. Now, Lord, thank you for what you want to do with her. Is this your husband there? Come, come with her. Uh, uh, we're done. Sometimes you feel the shift in the atmosphere there. You gotta change. So we're done. Come, please, sir. Are you in ministry? You're, 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 a, you're a pastor. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. For in thy presence there's healing divine. No Can he, Lord, only thine? Holy Spirit, thou art well. Come in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art well. Come. Omnipotent Father. Join hands together with your wife. Join hands with your wife. Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. There's a fresh visitation coming to you both, to your home. And a ministry that God is bringing forth, beautiful ministry. Tremendous healing atmosphere would be there in your meetings. Fill all the hungry. 
and a thirsty within. Restore us, sweet Father. Revive us once again. Now, what the Lord is telling me is there's going to be a healing atmosphere around you. In fact, you're feeling something on your hands while I'm talking now. I don't need that microphone. Take that mic away from that man. Take it away from him. Put it over here somewhere. Lord, I thank you. He's here right now, Greg. Pick him up, please. Both of them. Easy. Lift your hands like this, both of you. We don't need to wait. Lift your hands, seven. No, no pictures. We don't need to beg. He's passing out gifts for you. by her husband. He's passing out gifts by her husband for you to receive. Let her join hands with her husband. Christ. He's here. Bring Linda here and her husband. Bring Linda and her husband to meet your needs. So we press. So we press. So we press. See, the Lord's going to use the these amazing people in a powerful way. 
those of you that want, if, if, if you want God to use you, lift your hands and ask Him. So we praise. So we praise. Uh, shh, 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 shh. Quiet, 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 quiet. Shh, quiet. Quiet. All of you in front of me, join hands. Right here, you see what I am? Join hands, please. Use them! So we praise. So we praise. Stand to the side. Stand to, okay, Linda, stand to the side, darling. All of it, join hands. We praise your name. So kill them. Use them! So we praise. So we praise. Come on, lift your hands. Ask God to use you. So we praise. Back up, back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. Join hands right here, guys. All of you right here. So we pray. Use them. So we pray. So we pray. Come with me, sir. So we pray. We pray. Your name. Praise. Lift your hands and pray. Come on, out loud. Lord, we agree. Use your people. We agree, Lord, these of your people of the Spirit. Use them. He's here right now. He's here right now. We don't. We're passing our gifts. Pick it up. For you to receive. Help her up. Come on, get up and help him. There's something, there's something new coming, Sue. <sighs> to meet your needs. So we praise. So we praise. Wait, 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 wait. I'm not done with you. The Lord is not done with this, girl. Pick up Suzanne. Your name. Bring your... Come on up here. New doors are opening for you, Sue. New doors, darling. Just the wife. in her being thank God thank God all right so your wife Bishop come your wife the Lord is going to do something really new with her don't be shocked by the things that she'll experience you know sometimes our wives will see things we don't see. Sometimes they'll say things we don't really understand. <sighs> Pick him up. The Lord's going to clear your... It's happening just a little more. Right? Yeah. Help him up. Help him up. It's just like a clearing. That's why I just waved at him. There's a clearing of the mind in you to, to understand things she'll say. Like sometimes 
she'll pray in tongues when you're not really ready for her doing that. And I think the Lord sometimes, uh, he, hmm, I don't know why he does certain things. Now, we were in a plane crash and my wife was bleeding coming out. I pulled her out of that plane in 83 and she was praying in tongues with the blood flowing and I could not figure that one out. But God was using her to protect us from Satan's plan. Before that, when the, when the, when the engine stopped, April, of, April, May of 83, she was scared and she had her nails in my flesh like this because she was scared. She was holding my hand and her nails were going in my... It was, she was really hurting me, but she, she, she kind of was kind of out of it, you know? And then the, the plane hit and rolled and I began laughing to my surprise. I was laughing in the spirit that to, to this day, I don't even understand why I did it, but just holy laughter came on me for the first time in my life in a plane crash, if you can believe it, of all places. And she starts praying in tongues with the blood coming out of her arm and her leg. And I pull her out of the plane and she's praying in tongues and she still doesn't remember it to this day. It was supernatural for a man to laugh while you're dying or think you're going to die. And she's praying in tongues with the blood going everywhere. And they, 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 they came, the, the, the ambulance came on this farm and picked up her body and she's bleeding and she's praying I don't to this day I don't know why she prayed like that all I know is God was using her I suppose to protect us from something that the devil wanted to do so your wife is going to have that your wife is going to have experiences like that so they, they may come across as not normal but sometimes God will allow that. I don't know why. Okay. All right. Now, Lord, in Jesus' name, I want every woman who believes God has called you into ministry, get down here. That's good. You're doing a good job. I'll pay you for that. <laughs> So we pray. And, and Bishop Don, we're going to have an amazing time in your church. The Lord just showed me that when I was praying earlier. Sunday night is going to be explosive. Sunday night is going to be like, <laughs> out of this world. No, you stay right here, so I'm not done with you. Okay. You ready? Girls, you ready? You, 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 you don't mind if I, if I call you girls or ladies? Much nicer, huh? Come closer. Oh, ooh, watch this the woman there. My, my. Okay. Joan, Joan, Joan hands. Joan hands. Okay. So the Lord's going to give you a ministry, guys. Maybe some of you are going to have a new ministry, okay? You ready for it? You sure? Okay. No, no, no. Don't touch your wife. Don't touch your wife. She needs this. Here. 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 Whoa, 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 whoa. Here, ladies. Here, here, here. Go, 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 go. Go, 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 go. That's right, that's right. Go, go. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. I love it. I just love it. When God does that, woo, I love it. Now, you just felt like a force come on you. That's the part of God. Now, lift your hands and say more. Say more, Lord. More, more, more. Ladies, look at me here. I see you. I, 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 I see it right, right on you. Whoa, whoa. Just I see it on you. Look at me. Look. <laughs> there. There, 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 there. That's it. Watch, 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 watch. Easy, easy. Okay. Now, lift your hands like this. And I want you to pray in tongues for like five minutes. Wait, wait, oh, stop, stop. Suzanne is going is to lead you in tongues. 
And when you start praying in tongues, I'm gonna, I don't want this on camera. I don't want this live. Shut the camera off. Shut the camera off. The world will not understand what's going to happen now. Okay? The world will actually mock it. So we're, we're really done with them. We don't want them to be a part of this. So you're going to pray in tongues. And Linda, you can.